thanks firstly to Viju, uh, and apologies to uh, Professor Geert, who's already heard me, I think, twice, maybe three times, he must be tired. Uh, driving in this afternoon was quite an experience for me, because uh, a little more than 40 years ago, I used to drive into the um, Francie Fonsel residence to pick up my girlfriend, and then that eventually turned into a marriage, and I, I married my doctor wife, and we lived in the doctor's quarters, just around the corner. I don't know if they're still doctor's quarters, but they were so, they, they were so interesting, because one day a friend of ours came and he said, do you buy special newspapers here? I said, no, why? He said, well, the toilets are so small, you can't open a normal one. <laughs> I don't know if any of you stayed there, but we, had, we have wonderful memories of being there. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, I think, something that's very topical, and that is the issue of litigation. Um, just so that you do know a little bit about me, I have to confess to being a very enthusiastic litigator. And I think like all of you present here with the passion for medicine and the passion for helping people that you have and the drive that you have to do this, it's your life. Uh, for me, litigation was the same. And I really believe that by litigating and litigating hard, uh, I, was, I was helping people um, to achieve justice. And I was such a hard litigator that, hello, Prof, nice to see you. Uh, Prof's also a qualified mediator. You should really be talking standing here doing the talking, uh, you and Lut. <laughs> you don't know yet. <laughs> Am I a little bit early? Um, so, so we have, I think, all of us lawyers, and there, there are a lot of people that don't say good things about lawyers, but what we don't know is that it, most lawyers are really dedicated good people that actually want to help their clients. Just like you want to help your patients, they want to help their clients where an injustice has been done to, to bring about a just outcome. That's really what we're all about. So how did I do it? I worked incredibly hard. Um, I'm very lucky to still be able to say that the woman I met here 40 years ago is still married to me. Because working hard as a lawyer means that you work night and day. You really have to dedicate every single moment that you have. And what happens to you is you get, you get caught up in these, these cases to such an extent that you really don't spend an awake moment, and I'm sure it's similar with you, not thinking about the case, like you think about your patients all the time or a problem that you have all the time. And so I found that this consumed my life completely. And I walked into my secretary's office one day after spending four years litigating in Gauteng in a very big matter, and I said, Belinda, that's me, I'm done. She said, what are you talking about? You're at the pinnacle of your career. I said, Belinda, I'm done. No more. I could see my family falling apart, and I could see my life going where I didn't want it to go. So <clears throat> then I started to look at alternatives. And I thought, let me start an arbitration forum because I can do that from my home, from my farm, and I can be with my family and I can lead a decent life. And somebody said, no, no, you mustn't do arbitration. You must do mediation. And I knew absolutely nothing about mediation at that time. And I've told this story often before, and I tell it again because when you go and talk to your advocate friends and your lawyer friends about mediation, Many of them are going to tell you, oh, it's nonsense, or it's a soft option, or it doesn't work, or whatever the case may be. But then your next question to them must be, have you trained as a mediator? Do you really understand the process? Because a lot of people don't. They think they do, but they don't. And certainly senior advocates in, in the position in which I was when I was initially told about mediation, you'll get the answer that I gave, and that was, it's a complete waste of time. And then because I was going to start this arbitration center, somebody said, but Alan, there's a training course. Go and attend the training course and then express an opinion when you really know what this is about. So I attended the training course for five days. And on the fourth day, I have to confess that I lay in a hotel room in Cape Town and I had this amazing realization that what I thought I was doing with my life, bringing just outcomes to, to my clients, was in fact so. And instead of achieving just outcomes through litigating and litigating hard, I was often doing exactly the opposite. And the realization came when I saw that mediation can achieve just outcomes much quicker, much less expensively, and much, much, much better than litigation can. And so that brought about quite a big change in my life. So what I want to talk to you about today is the difference between mediation and litigation. What's the difference between these two concepts? And then I want to, if I can, measure them with you 
by the standard of what justice is. So let's start off talking about what is justice, and then we look at mediation and we ask what's its ability to achieve just outcomes, and we look at litigation and we ask what's its ability to achieve just outcomes. So that's kind of the pattern of what I want to talk to you about, and just sketch those two differences, um, and then just give you a little bit of insight into some cases. I know doctors always want case studies. So a few case studies, uh, recent cases on these two topics. So justice is really achieving an outcome to conflict or a dispute that is morally right and fair and in accordance with the law. That's a good standard of justice. I think you know we have a lot of talk about justice going around these days, especially in our country where there are lots of problems. But that essentially is what justice is. So then we're going to look at mediation now, we look at litigation and measure them against which of these two mechanisms has the ability to bring about just outcomes uh, or not. And then you'll understand why I woke up in the middle of the night worried about what I'd been doing with 40 years of my life. So what is litigation? Litigation is a process, right? It's a process where a public official that's really what judges are. I, I was an acting judge last year, and believe you me, you're nothing other than a public official. And I sat in the tea room and heard them all complain about their salaries and the fact that they're not going to get raises, and so they are public officials like everybody else. But they decide cases by applying the law to their understanding or their perception of the facts. Now, I'd like to pause there on this thing, the law and their perception of the facts, because this is important. I was at a conference the other day and a colleague, a senior colleague from Port Elizabeth stood up and he said, you know, as advocates we may never mislead the court as to the facts. We are duty bound to always make sure that the court is not misled in regard to the facts. Now how about this? How many thousands of cases aren't there running all over this country, all over the world with advocates standing on both sides, really reputable, decent people who are not scoundrels, presenting judges with completely different sets of facts. They're not misleading the court. Why is it that we've got these different sets of facts that the judge now is given that he must apply the law to? And an amazing thing that I realized uh, after some years of mediating is that when people are in conflict, when there is a disagreement between people, they create in their minds a new reality. And why is it? It's because we're all human beings. Because no human being wants to admit that he's wrong, or that he is bad, or that he is dishonest, or that he did something that he shouldn't have done. So the human brain tends to shut out those facts that show you up in a bad light. And when you've got conflict, you've got two people doing the same thing. The man on this side of the fence is shutting out a a set of facts to make himself look honorable and good and decent and right. And the person on the other side, I'm not going to say a woman because it might not be a woman, is doing exactly the same thing. That mind is going through exactly the same process. So what, he, what you eventually sit with in these litigated cases is two sets of completely different facts. I listened to the Eskom, I'm sure some of you saw it on television last night, the Eskom dispute a fact that there is. And the man sits there, one of them, and he, he says he didn't do that. And the other one says he did do that. Well, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. But that's what happens to us when we're in conflict. So we go and see our lawyer. Mr. A goes to see his lawyer, and his lawyer talks to him about those facts and says, but you know, Mr. A, I'm not sure those facts, the court's going to believe what you're saying as far as those facts are concerned, because it doesn't sound right to me. So what that person's brain does is it shifts him a little bit further and tidies up that uncertainty in his evidence so that when it's presented, it's more plausible and more acceptable. And exactly the same is happening to the other side. So both of them, with their astute and clever lawyers, are reinventing even further the facts upon which these cases rely. So what is the judge faced with? And I'm telling you it's like that in every single matter. In all of these cases that we've got running all over the world, the judge has got a series of facts, set of facts A and a set of facts B, and neither of them actually are reality. But the judge can't decide the case on something in between the two. He's got to decide either on the basis of facts A or on the basis of facts B. He can't pick. So whose set of facts eventually gets believed? The one with the better lawyer, the one who's more articulate, 
the one who doesn't blush a lot when he's caught out on a question and is uh, clever with his answers, well, whatever the case may be. Now, I ask you, is it morally right and fair that a public official takes a decision by applying facts that are not in all respects reality and then applying that to the law and coming to a conclusion? Can it ever be absolutely morally right and fair? That so many things, who your expert witnesses are, who your lawyer is, how well he prepared, how, many, how good a cross-examiner he is, how he caught somebody out or didn't catch them out, etc., etc., that all of those things eventually influence this poor public official's ability to decide who is right and who is wrong. So that's what litigation is. He proclaims on his understanding of the facts who is right and who is wrong by applying the law to those facts. It's an extremely uncertain mechanism for getting at the truth and for deciding where the truth lies. And in medico-legal matters, it is more difficult than in any other because there, judges are not themselves qualified medical practitioners. Judges have to rely on the opinions of experts. And you know and I know that just like the lawyers helping people to create new reality, we have experts that also, sadly, do exactly the same thing. And we have different realities based on what opinions are expressed by experts. But again, remember, this expert's basing his opinion on this set of facts, and this one is basing his opinion on that set of facts. So we can't really blame them either. But litigation is adversarial. In other words, the boxing gloves are on. It is adjudicative. A decision gets taken and forced on the parties, and invariably the parties are never happy. And that's why most cases, well, I would say 90, 99% of cases, there is at the very least an application for leave to appeal at the end of the first judgment. So people want to take it somewhere else because they do not accept that the judge was right in finding in favor of the other side. Sometimes they get leave to appeal, sometimes they don't. Often they get leave to appeal and they lose, very often also, though, they get leave to appeal and they succeed. In medico-legal matters especially, because it's such a difficult, not, it's an easy test, but applying the facts and coming to the right conclusion is no easy matter. It's also publicity prone. So we're going to take you to a case in a moment, and I'm going to show you what that can potentially do. And that is, I think, one of the main reasons why in medico-legal disputes, the system of litigation does not have the ability to produce outcomes that are morally right and fair. Because, never mind whether the doctor eventually gets exonerated from all blame, by the time you get there, you are a ruined human being. You're a ruined human being because of what you have to go through in order to find out that you were not liable by means of this particular process. So what is facilitative mediation? Think of it this way. Think of it this way. When you're in conflict with somebody else, when there is a dispute, it is often extremely difficult for people to talk to one another. You have a major fallout in your marriage. You have a major fallout in a family relationship. You fight with your brother because you don't agree with what he did. And that conflict escalates. It becomes increasingly difficult for parties to talk to one another. And what mediation really does, it, it imposes a third party with particular skills and abilities in this conflict zone to assist people to negotiate. That's really all that a mediator does. He facilitates the negotiation, the talks, makes it possible for people that are in conflict to talk to one another, to see one another, to hear one another, to listen to one another, and to themselves couch a solution that they both find Acceptable. In other words, it's not a decision imposed from above. It's a decision that the parties themselves arrive at as to how they should resolve this conflict. So the definition is it's a process where disputants engage an independent third party, an impartial third party. Very, very important that he be independent and impartial and that assists them in resolving conflict. It is confidential. In other words, it doesn't reach the newspapers. You can't talk about it after the, after the mediation is over, which sadly is one of the inhibiting factors in making mediation the mainstream mechanism for resolving conflict because we can't walk around putting up our arms and telling everybody as mediators the success that we have had in resolving this dispute between Professor so-and-so and 
Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. This and Mr. That. We're not able to do that. We have to be very careful because we can't uh, breach the confidentiality aspect. And then critically important, it's consensual. In other words, the outcome is based on what the parties themselves find acceptable. What's important about this is that unlike litigation, where one party is always unhappy about the result, always, mediation because it's consensual, because the parties have been helped to find their own solution, parties accept the outcome. They're happy with the result because it's their decision to resolve the conflict in a particular way. So let's just compare some of the differences between litigation and mediation. In litigation, the outcome is imposed by a third party. In mediation, the outcome is determined by the parties themselves. In litigation, the outcome is based on legal rights, so-called legal rights. In mediation, the outcome is based on needs, interests, and concerns. Let me illustrate the difference if we talk about a medical legal matter. Medico legal matter, the outcome depends upon a judge finding that a medical practitioner did or did not act negligently and that his negligence caused the adverse outcome and the harm that the patient suffered. Okay? Now, that is a legal outcome, a legal decision. You were either negligent or you weren't. There's either a causal link between your negligence and the adverse outcome or there isn't a, 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 a causal link. Nothing else matters to the judge. That's all that he focuses on. In mediation, it's different. In mediation, we try to resolve matters looking forward and basing the outcome on what people really want, what they really need, and what their interests are. So the patient in the mediation is spoken to, speaks to the doctor, the doctor speaks to the patient, and we as mediators then get a chance in a confidential environment to explore with the patient what it is that they really want, what, is, what it is that they really need, what are their interests. And those interests are vast and varied because every human being is different. But for example, in a medical legal matter, what is it that you really want? I had a mediation a while ago where somebody's uh, knee replacement popped out. Apparently it's very rare, 0.5% uh, circumstances that will happen. Now, that patient wants one thing and one thing only, and that's for that problem to be fixed. That's the real need, that's the real interest, and that's the real concern. And if possible, to, be go, to go back to be able to do the things that she or he is, 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 really wants to do. That's what mediation focuses on. Litigation focuses on, was the doctor negligent in the manner in which he performed the knee replacement operation? Is he at fault and did he cause the knee to jump out? And is he therefore liable for an amount of money to compensate the patient for the pain and suffering that she's gone through, and potentially for another operation, and maybe for loss of income? But in litigation, we talk money, 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 and money only. In mediation, we talk interests, needs, and concerns. And people laugh at me when I say this. But in this knee matter that I mediated the other day, I just saw it again. I had a wonderful doctor who, although the expert opinions were that he wasn't liable, said to the patient, you know, I hear what all of these experts are saying. He said, but you know, where I was taught at my university, my professor said, you're always responsible for your patient. And I want to tell you, Mrs. So-and-so, I feel terrible about the fact that you've gone through all of this pain. It doesn't matter whether I'm liable or not. I still feel responsible and I want to help you. And he tendered a whole lot of things way beyond what uh, the, the, the insurer was prepared to pay and prepared to do in the circumstances. And that matter was resolved very beautifully based on things that had nothing to do with money. And that's the beauty about mediation. We can explore all these possibilities. We can find out who the people are that we are dealing with. We talk to the doctor. We find out what's important to the doctor. This doctor, more than anything else, wanted to take this woman out of her pain zone, wanted to do whatever he could to make her life better. He even went so far as to ultimately uh, to offer her uh, time with her family in, in his seaside cottage. And she broke down in tears when that offer was made because she could see this man really cared about her. And even though he wasn't legally liable, according to the experts, was still prepared to do whatever he could to make her life better. And at no cost to himself, because that guest house is empty 99% of the year. So we just go back to the comparison. In litigation, only one party can win. In mediation, we try to achieve outcomes where both parties are happy, i.e. win-win solutions. Litigation destroys people and their relationships. I have never had a single case, and you can imagine, where after the case... People walk up to, to one another, shake hands, and say, great, nice to see you again, and when can we go and have a beer, or whatever the case may be. It never happens. 
when, where lit matters are litigated, it's not only the parties themselves often whose relationship are destroyed, but it's for generations to come. People don't speak to one another because of what litigation does. In mediation, parties try, uh, 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 the dignity of the parties and their relationships are maintained. In this matter, I mediated last week. When I left the mediation in Johannesburg, the doctor and the patient were sitting in a corner talking to one another uh, about whatever. Absolutely a wonderfully restored, good relationship between them with massive relief for both the patient and the medical doctor that was quite evident. So in litigation, we have what we call the one action lump sum rule that you all know about. It's particularly, uh, it's been in the news a lot recently, especially in cerebral palsy cases, where these massive awards are being made of up to 23, 40 million, I think is the highest so far. But that's a one action lump sum rule where you've got to quantify in advance how long somebody's going to live, what kind of job they would have done, and you, you, you calculate their loss of income based on those postulated outcomes, uh, and, and that is why it takes as long as it does and why it entails so many experts, because people end up speculating about how long somebody would have lived that had cerebral palsy, what kind of job they would have had, what kind of income they would have enjoyed, and then also as far as medical costs are concerned, what are they going to need for, how long are they going to need it, etc., 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 because you've only got one chance. Of course, in mediation, you've got unlimited solutions, unlimited. There's no fixed set of solutions that you can... You can um, you can get parties, uh, have parties agree upon. So litigation is time consuming. Uh, I've made a note there that it can take up to 10 years and it can cost millions. In fact, the longest uh, cerebral palsy matter has lasted for 16 years. Now we know in cerebral palsy cases, the first seven years of the child's life are the time during which you can make a difference of some sort to, to the quality of the child's life. If you litigate those cases, those seven years are lost. They're lost. You can't help the child anymore after the first seven years. And by far the majority of the cases take more than that seven year period. Mediation is quick and it's inexpensive. Uh, it lasts one to two days. Let's take a particularly complicated matter. The longest that I've mediated matter has been for 10 days, but there were over 250 interested parties in that case. Over in 10 days, not 16 years, not 10 years, 10 days. Uh, and we find, on average, cases don't last longer than one to two days. And it costs less, I would almost venture to say, far less than 1% of what litigation does. So let's formulate that question again with reference to this difference. Which of these two procedures has the ability to produce outcomes that are morally right and fair and in accordance with the law? Well, it's always in accordance with the law to sit down with somebody that you have a disagreement with and to work out a solution yourselves. So mediation is always in accordance with the law. Of course, there are cases that we can't mediate, uh, some of them pretty topical recently involving fraud and dishonesty and so on. Um, but I want to then, if I may, take you to two cases. One involves people in the public sector. Uh, you might well know about this case. It's recent. It's here in the Western Cape. It involved the Mowbray Clinic. And the other involves two private practitioners who also may be known to you. I can talk about both of these cases because they are, they are reported cases, they're not mediated cases, and the facts are on record. So in the uh, case of AB and IB versus the MEC for Health and Social Development, the case was about a child who was born normally, four days later developed um, a jaundice, went back to hospital, uh, there was a problem, the child um, was re-admitted, had brain damage, and the hospital admitted that there was negligence. So, so, so ha here's the thing. There's no dispute that that child was negligently treated. So the issue as to whether somebody was at fault was agreed in advance. There was no dispute about that. There was no need to fight about that. There was no need to call experts about that. So let's look at what happened in that case. The only issue was the amount of damages. The time taken from the incident to judgment, eight years. That's just to work out how much money must be paid for the child's cerebral palsy. Eight years. The number of experts engaged, 37. 37 experts. The duration of the trial, 51 days. The amount awarded, 17 million. And I've done a rough estimate that the cost of the matter was between 14 and 18 million. We are still trying to get to the bottom of it. They are hiding the figures from us. 
They don't want us to know what the total costs are. And they say this is an exceptional case. Well, I don't know how exceptional it must be to warrant the employment of 37 experts and to take eight years and 51 days in court for it to be resolved. So here's something that I quote from the judgment of Judge Rogers. He says, It is disconcerting to a judge to be faced with opposing phalanxes of experts, on the one side supporting higher claims, and on the other side supporting lower claims, with the gaps between them often very great. Is it mere coincidence that each side's experts reached conclusions favorable to the side that engaged them? And, you know, we blame the lawyers a lot for, for litigation and the cost of litigation, the time it takes. But experts play a significant role. And Paul's going to talk to you just now about a solution that SASOG have arrived at in order to curtail this kind of abuse and that I think is a, is a really positive um, addition to bringing about just outcomes in these matters. So we've got this vicious cycle in the public health sector. Lawyers act on a contingency basis. For those of you that don't know what that means, it means that if I act on contingency and I lose the case, I get nothing for my uh, professional services, and I also don't recover the expenses that have been incurred. If I win, however, I get double my fee. So if my fee is 50000 a day, I get 100000 a day, or 25% of the capital. So if the capital was 18 million, 25% of that would be what I can charge, whichever is the lesser. But it's a massive, believe you me, just think in terms of your own professional fees. It's a massive incentive for a lawyer to act on a contingency. If we look at the Detroit, sorry, the AB matter that I referred to earlier, why were there 37 experts engaged? All I can tell you is that Fifteen of those were engaged by the department, and the rest were engaged by the private practitioner, and those were attorneys acting on contingency. And every time you brief an expert, it takes time, it costs money, and your own till is going clink, 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 clink. So the more experts that are engaged, the more your fee will be, the more you can double. And in a matter where it's only about quantum, it's like a cricket game where you've already won the game. It's just the score. By how many runs you're going to win the game. So you know, before you even appoint the first expert in that matter, that you are going to be able to earn double your fee for all the time and the effort that you spend with that expert. So what happens here? This is the vicious circle. We've got claims. We've got more legal costs being incurred. Those costs are paid, I'm not sure how it works in the Western Cape, out of your budget, out of the hospital's budget? No, by the department. In other provinces, out of the hospital budget. That results in a reduced budget, even if it's the medical budget. Poorer infrastructure, more claims. More claims, more legal fees, and so the circle just keeps on going and going and going. And believe you me, the Western Cape is by far, but by far, the province that has the least problem as far as this is concerned. In other provinces, I believe they've even attached the computers and the furniture in Gauteng to pay for claims. So here's another part of the sad, uh, when, we, when we consider whether litigation can bring about outcomes in medical legal matters that are morally right and fair. This is a case involving two very senior general practitioners. They both, they both practiced for as long more or less as I was a lawyer, both of them 40 years, very highly respected general practitioners. They saw a patient, um, Mrs. Minnie. Now, I need to tell you a little bit about Mrs. Minnie. Mrs. Minnie was a secretary for a lawyer. The lawyer that she's a secretary for is one of the most skilled and highly qualified lawyers in the medico-legal field. She acts for one of the big insurers. So she really knows what she's doing. This is, no, this is nobody's fool. This is really a top-class person. Her secretary comes to work one day and at the end of the day is a little bit wobbly. She goes off to see practitioner A. Practitioner A says he diagnosed her with a mild stroke. She says no, the practitioner just told her that she'd suffered from hypertension. Goes back to work the next day, is a bit more wobbly. And her boss, the lawyer, the skilled lawyer says, go and see our family general practitioner. Who's practitioner B, general practitioner B. And off she goes and she sees that practitioner. That practitioner diagnoses a mild stroke and gives her treatment for a mild stroke. The reality is she suffered from a rare 
uh, stroke type complication, which I believe they call a stroke in evolution. So it's mild and it gets a little bit more, a little bit more. It's not over in one go. It's kind of growing as time goes by. Very rare, um, but so she suffers that stroke and then she institutes a claim against both of these general practitioners. So the case is heard by the Cape Provincial Division. I think it took about six and a half, seven years before that matter was disposed of. Just on the merits. They split merits and quantum, so it's not about the amount of money. It's are the doctors liable or not, yes or no. Cape Provincial Division decides both doctors are liable, both were negligent, both should have sent her to a hospital. And what's more, finds that because of the dispute of fact, accepts Mrs. Minnie's version of what was said and rejects the doctor's version. And in effect, finds that the doctor perjured himself. So just for a moment, put yourself in the position of these two human beings. Both dedicated, both excellent general practitioners, both gave their lives to their profession. For seven years, they have this doubt hanging over their heads. Are we liable or are we not? Did we do something wrong or didn't we? Did we act according to the standards of our calling or didn't we? Every day, they go to bed with that thought in their minds. The seventh year, a Cape court decides they were both negligent, and there's a causal link between their negligence and the damages that were suffered, and one of them didn't tell the truth. So they go on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And thankfully for the doctors, the Supreme Court of Appeal finds, one, no negligence, two, accepts the doctor's versions of the facts as put before it, and finds there was also no causal link. There was no link between anything that the doctors did. This was something that would have happened anyway, no matter what, where this patient went. But it took 10 years. 10 years. I practiced as an advocate for 40. That is 25% of my professional career with this hanging over my head for somebody at the end of the day to say, Alan, you didn't act contrary to the standard of your calling. What you did was in order. I mean, can, that, can it ever be morally right and fair to put a fellow human being through that kind of trauma in order to determine how you must be helped or not helped? So I just look at these two cases and I say, apply what happened here and then ask yourself, is or is facilitative mediation a better way of achieving justice than litigation. If we talk about facilitative mediation, because there's a kind of mediation that shouldn't be called mediation at all, and they talk about it as adjudicative mediation, and that's where the mediator decides who's right and who's wrong. I say that's a nonsense. That's a no-no, because I know if you want to decide who's right and who's wrong, you've unfortunately got to go through the Chapakin and Levy procedure and eventually get the best brains in the country to sit on the facts and the law and decide who's right and who's wrong. And sometimes they even get it wrong. But certainly a mediator can't in a day or a day and a half decide who's right and who's wrong. So we don't work with that. The kind of mediation we talk about is mediation where the mediator merely facilitates the negotiations to help parties find a solution. So I'm hoping you'll all agree with that conclusion. And I just want to talk to you about the essential features of mediation, just to give you some idea. And this is one of the problems that we also have when we talk to people about mediation. It's kind of up there somewhere, and it's loose, and it's really very difficult to get people to understand mediation. And I'm sure, Prof, you'll agree with me, uh, and Prof Hitz, you'll agree with me that you've got to do it, and you've got to do it a number of times to see what, what potential solutions come out of a given set of circumstances and how you go about choosing the best of those solutions before you really understand it. But here are some of the essential features. Firstly, it is a structured process in a controlled environment, and it's voluntary. This is amazingly powerful. Many people will say, but if it's voluntary, I can go and I can come and I can leave whenever I like. Yes, that's what we tell people. But we add a little, a little rider to that. And we say, it's voluntary. You can leave whenever you want to. But do me a favor. Talk to me first. Can I have your agreement and your agreement that you'll talk to me before you walk out of these negotiations? Tell me what you're unhappy about and let's see whether we can address that. You know, that is so powerful. That added to the voluntary nature, nature of mediation is so powerful that a good mediator can keep people at the negotiating table forever. And I've had situations where people have said, yeah, no, sir, Leclerc, they don't want to talk anymore. They've had enough. They don't trust the other side. We go outside, we talk for a little while, they come back, and we find a solution. So it's an amazingly powerful tool that the mediator has to keep people at the negotiating table until a solution is found. That's the first one. 
The second thing is it's not binding until a written agreement is signed. Now, what's the benefit of that? We tell people when they're mediating, say, listen, this is not binding. You don't have to worry. You can put forward any idea, anything that you think might help end this crisis, this conflict, this disagreement, this unhappiness, anything that you think. It's a little bit like the, 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 the knee surgeon's um, holiday cottage. Anything. Put it out there. See whether it'll work. Maybe another operation. Maybe an operation by my friend who's the top guy in this particular industry. Or maybe we'll go in together and we'll see what we can do for you. There, there are endless possibilities that you can throw out. And they are non-binding. You can withdraw them later. If the patient remains unpleasant or whatever, you can withdraw it. So you can chuck things out and nothing binds anybody. An apology. The doctor can tender an apology. It's not binding. He can withdraw it later. That's how the rules work until a written agreement is signed. And this gives you the wonderful flexibility of putting out ideas to try to bring the conflict to an end. Then it's also without prejudice. What does that mean? That means that if the mediation doesn't bring about a successful outcome, nothing that is said or done during the mediation binds the parties if it's got to be litigated later. Very, very useful for an apology. I know that the that the indemnifier that you had for many, many years used to say you are not allowed to tender an apology because if you do, that they'll bring it up in court and you're going to be found liable for that. Well, in mediation, you can tender an apology. You can tender it freely, openly, with your whole heart and in, a, in the best way you possibly can because it is without prejudice and cannot be used against you in litigation later. It's also confidential, so you're not faced with this concern about what the newspapers are going to say or what the faculty will say, or what the department will say, or what your colleagues will say. Um, and, and then, of course, the important feature is the, the mediator's neutrality. So he's really there to help both parties. He's there to work hard, equally hard, for both of the parties. And that's very important. And doesn't know either of them, or shouldn't know either of them. So what is a mediator's primary responsibility? We say all that he does is he creates an environment, a space, if you like, a space to help the parties to find the best possible solution that they can, that they both find acceptable. That's his job. His job is not to make sure that the mediation is successful and that there is a positive outcome. That's not his job. That's up to the parties. They must decide whether they can find one another. The mediator's job is just to create an environment, a space, an operating theater, if you like, with the best possible equipment to allow the patients and the doctor to find the best possible solution. So what is the best possible solution? We, I often depict it with these two triangles. If we say the triangle on the left is party A, and we look for solutions that cost party A very little but have great value to party B, and by the same token, something that costs party B a little but has great value to party A. And in medical matters, it's actually very easy to, 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 to give you examples of this because least cost solutions often would, let's just redo the op for you, and I won't charge you. And in fact, I'll talk to MediClinic or Tigerberg Hospital and let's see whether we can arrange a special subsidized rate or whatever the case may be for you in the circumstances. Least cost to the practitioner, huge value to the patient. And so those are the sort of solutions that we try and look for. So there are certain challenges in medico-legal matters. I'm not going to spend too much time on this with you, but <clears throat> there is really an important thing that we have got to guarantee the independence and the impartiality of the process. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because in South Africa today, a lot of the disputes that we have involve people that don't have any money. How we normally make sure that there's impartiality in the process is we get the parties each to pay half of the fee of the mediator. So it's not on the one party side or on the other. In South Africa, a lot of these disputes are going to come up in situations where the potential plaintiff doesn't have any money. So we've got to try and take care of that. And also, uh, it is going to be necessary, I think certainly in big matters, for those parties also to enjoy legal representation, to make sure that the outcome is fair because the mediator doesn't give advice. So that's a particular challenge. Paul and I are meeting that challenge with a colleague by setting up a fund to fund uh, indigent people so that they can pay their half share through the foundation. Then there are also conflicting interests, and I think it's necessary for all of you to think about this. Until now, medical practitioners and also some hospitals, not all, but some hospitals 
are in the hands of the insurers. The insurers decide how your case must be run. They decide what you must do. They, must, they decide when you must do it and how you must do it. So what is the insurer's interest? Is it the same as yours as a medical practitioner? I think not. As a medical practitioner, you want this uncertainty, doubt, unhappiness out of your life as soon as possible. If you've done something wrong, you actually want to go to somebody and say, I did something wrong, I'm terribly sorry, how can we fix this? Your insurer's got a different agenda. Your insurer often's agenda is, let's stretch it out as long as we can. Many of these cases might not come to fruition, so let's not worry about them uh, prematurely, or uh, let's pay as late as possible because these are damages claims, there's no interest issues, and the longer we stretch it out, the better it's going to be for us. Is that your interest? Is that what you really want? I mediated the matter recently where the attorney said to me, but we want, we want a precedent. We want the Supreme Court of Appeal and, you know, even maybe the Constitutional Court to decide uh, on this issue of uh, consent. What exactly must a consent contain or not contain? So I turned to the specialist, one of the top specialists in the country, sitting on my left. I said, sir, is that what you want? That this should take another six to eight years for the Constitutional Court to decide uh, how your consent form should look. He said, good heavens, no. That's the last thing in the world that I want. This matter must be ended and ended now. So you do have these conflicting interests that we have to work with uh, in mediation. And then issues of negligence, causation, and damages. We've got some clever people who think that they can decide these things in mediation, and we are distancing ourselves from them. It's unfortunate that they've gone there, and I'm sure they're going to burn their fingers sooner, th sooner than later. And then, as I've said earlier, ensuring just outcomes for all, including the poor. This is something that is really, really important because it's no good having a process which we say is morally, brings about results that are morally right and fair and in accordance with the law, but because somebody's poor and doesn't have a lawyer, there are undersettlements. That's something that we've got to guard against very carefully. So overcoming these challenges, we, we believe uh, in our organization, and, and we're a not-for-profit organization that GIRT already belongs to and Prof soon going to belong to, but we're a not-for-profit organization that believes in early intervention. Our whole philosophy is around making sure that issues that arise between doctor and patient are addressed as soon as possible. We are even going... And not only in terms of mediation, in other words, that the mediations take place as soon as possible, but we are working now towards a scenario of making sure that hospital managers uh, and, and clinicians in hospitals are trained so that they can take care of these issues, as many of them as they possibly can, right when they arise, even before mediation takes place. But if they can't, that the mediation takes place as soon as possible, so that you don't have to wait four years before you can sleep peacefully again. And that's one of the things that the Mediation Foundation is going to address. I'm not going to bore you with the detail of that now. So how does this early intervention work? It's what we call a pre-mediation meeting. It's just, it's a meeting between parties in conflict, meeting between a patient and a doctor, a meeting between a patient and a hospital that arises as soon as there is dissatisfaction that the hospital can't resolve or the doctor can't resolve with the patient. So as we've said, now a third party steps in to help to facilitate the further talks between the parties. So, but we've even got a process before that. It's what we call pre-mediation. What's the purpose of this pre-mediation? It's a meeting so that a qualified person can say to the patient, patient, this is how mediation works. This is basically what will happen. It's voluntary. You can end it whenever you want to. It's without prejudice. It's confidential. It's, it'll take one to two days. It can be over within the next week or two. It's going to cost you very little compared to litigation. It could give you fantastic outcomes. So the pre-mediator then explains to the parties how mediation works. It's a little bit like your informed consent. So a patient can either take a tablet or undergo a very expensive operation. You as a medical practitioner tell the patient about the tablet Try the tablet first. The patient tries the tablet first. That doesn't work, then he goes into the expensive operation. In pre-mediation, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell the patient about the tablet before they go the litigation route and incur the trauma and, and the time and the hassle that litigation entails. So we're just trying to give them an opportunity to decide for themselves do they want to mediate or do they not. Why? Because unfortunately, lawyers are not telling their patients about mediation. 
Now, you're all going to say it's because they're greedy buggers and they want to earn as much money as possible. It's not always so. I think in many, many cases it's because uh, uh, attorneys and advocates just don't know about mediation. They don't understand the process. They're where I was five years ago. So this is our way of overcoming that obstacle and making sure that mediation does work. So the purpose of this early intervention pre-mediation is also to establish if parties are suited for mediation. I hear the insurers say, I heard them the other day say, yes, but not every case can be mediated. There are matters that are too complicated for mediation. And my answer is absolute nonsense. It's not about the matter. It's not about how complicated it is. It's not about the medical intervention. It's about the people. You can have the most complicated case that there is. And if somebody is sitting there who really wants to put this behind them, wants a solution, wants to move on with their lives, they will come to mediation and the mediation will be successful. So we have got to establish in, in pre-mediation whether the parties are suited for mediation. Some of the specialists say, I don't care, you can do whatever you like, I'm not going to agree to anything, sue me. Well, then that person, the person, not the procedure, is unsuited for mediation. That's something we look at. Then we enable the parties to take this informed decision. We assist them to select a suitable mediator. And I'd like to pause there. There's also a school of thought, not in our camp, but in other camps, that says medical practitioners can't mediate. Absolute nonsense. You don't have to be a lawyer to mediate. You're not telling people about the law. You're helping people to find a solution. And often, because you're a medical practitioner, you'll be able to guide parties. You're not going to tell them what to do, but you can guide them to look at other options that a lawyer might never have thought about. Then you assist the parties to select a suitable mediator. If you're not suited for the matter, you'll, you'll help them to, to look for one. You establish if they can afford mediation. If they can't, uh, you'll look into the foundation. You'll also look at the necessity for legal representation and expert advice. What we are trying to encourage in our organization is that people will appoint one expert. So instead of having the phalanx that Roger spoke about, we'll just have one or two experts, and those experts will guide the parties to tell them uh, what the solution is or isn't. Appointment of lawyers, financial arrangements, exchange of information and documents. There might be a hospital file that's got to be made available. We make arrangements for that. Set a timetable and a venue and conclude an agreement to mediate. And then we'd like to also talk to you just for a second about the Mediation in Motion tracking protocol. Every case that comes to this not-for-profit organization, Mediation in Motion, goes into a computerized mechanism that traces it from the time that the Let's call it a complaint, for want of a better word. The complaint is made until the matter is finally resolved in the mediation. So the, the doctor, the patient, if there are lawyers involved, the lawyers, the experts can get access to their case on the computer and can find out exactly what its status is. Are we waiting for Professor so-and-so's expert opinion? Uh, when is our next date? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what's very important about this tracking protocol is we are, we are using it to feed information back into the system. So if, for example, during the course of the mediation, it is discovered that there's a problem in a hospital at a particular level, that information, with the permission of the parties, because it's confidential, will be fed back to the hospital as soon as possible. So instead of waiting seven years to find out that there was a difficulty in some department, the hospitals, we will hope, and also the medical practitioner, where it's a private practitioner, will find out exactly what the problem was, and it will be fed back. So, as far as the protocol is concerned, uh, SASOG has agreed to a protocol. That protocol has undergone, or mediation, pre-mediation clause has undergone quite a lot of change over time. And one of the reasons for that, the main reason for that is that the, when we wrote the SASOG, um, the SASOG protocol together, we kind of crossed the T's and dotted the I's. But it's a one and a half page document, look to my right. Uh, and, we've, and we've been asked by the hospitals and the doctors, let's just keep it small, you know, keep it simple. So this is what it boils down to now. In the case of a hospital, this is what the pre-mediation clause looks like. In the event that the patient has a grievance against the hospital and or any of its employees or staff as a result of an adverse event, the patient, and this we added just the other day, and or the hospital, shall as soon as possible initiate a free and confidential MIM pre-mediation meeting by contacting MIM. That's as simple as it is. And all that it does is it just says, if you're unhappy and you can't resolve the difficulty, set this pre-mediation process in motion so that the matter can be mediated before it gets out of hand and can be resolved as soon as possible. So that's for the practitioner. Um, if you 
in private practice and you don't work through a hospital, then it's very similar. It just talks about a practitioner. So we presented this pre-mediation procedure on a number of occasions, uh, Paul and I, from 2016 until now. I've added your date as well. And I must say, until now, every single organization that we presented it to has uh, supported it wholeheartedly. And we want this to become common practice. We want everybody to do it, and the foundation is then going to make the fact known that this is how things are done. It's not because doctors are trying to run away from their responsibility. It is because doctors are trying to help patients to find solutions as soon as possible if complications arise. It's as simple as that. So our plans for 2018, Paul, I didn't talk to you about this, but we want pre-mediation to become the norm. We want the public, practitioners and lawyers, to be educated about mediation. We want practitioners to insert the clause in their agreements with patients and hospitals to insert the clause in patient admission forms. It's so simple. We don't need legislation. We need nothing. We just need every organization to put it into a document because then it's part of the agreement and it is a method of ensuring that people follow this course by agreement. And you won't get a judge, you won't get into court if you don't follow this protocol. So that's me. Thank you very much. Let's hope we can do it. Paul, over to you. Um, thank you, Alan. I have a question just because of rumors that I'm picking up on that uh, the lawyers are counter-threatening with uh, holding the mediator liable if they feel the conclusion or the solution is perhaps not as much as what the patient could have gotten. To what extent is that a problem? It could potentially be a problem. That is one of the things that we're addressing in the foundation. Uh, there the, are the two things to, the, to remember. One is the mediator cannot give any advice. If a mediator gives advice, then they could potentially be liable. But certainly the mediation school that we're at teaches you are not allowed to give any advice, whether medical or legal. And you also mustn't steer people into a solution that they don't, don't want to be in. So in those circumstances, it would be extremely difficult to hold the mediator liable. But nevertheless, I think it's important that firstly mediators do have insurance. But if we manage to get the foundation off the ground, it will mean that People will not go into mediation without a lawyer unless that is what they want. So in those circumstances, the lawyer is there to advise the patient whether to settle or not to settle on a particular basis, and that should never be the function of the mediator. And in those circumstances, I can't see how they can ever hold the mediators liable. But it's not a bad idea to have insurance. Okay, one more question. Um, thank you for, I think, um, an, an interesting way in trying to address some of our issues. But what is the legal status of an agreement that's reached by um, this process? So if, if we do have this process, what prevents the, the, the victim or the patient or whatever to just institute another process after agreement that, okay, we'll do this, I'll go to your weekend house, but mm -hmm. the next week I'm still going to see you? Um, okay, the answer is, the answer is this. An agreement, an agreement like this, if, if parties are in dispute, doesn't matter. Let's say I bought a car from you and I'm unhappy about its condition and we talk to one another about it and we reach an agreement that you're going to pay for the engine to be redone. That is what we call a novation. It replaces the original dispute. So you can't sue on the original dispute, i.e. The, the fact that the car's engine wasn't up to standard. What you can sue on is my undertaking to fix the engine, and it's exactly the same thing. So provided you perform in accordance with what you undertook to do in the mediation agreement, then there can be no problem. And in any event, all that you can be sued on is a failure to perform in terms of that agreement. If, the, if summons has already been issued, these mediated agreements can be made orders of court, and then they are the equivalent of a judgment by the judge, of an order of the court. So, so it's as binding as any other judgment as binding as any other novated agreement in circumstances where there has been no summons. Unfortunately, you can't, in circumstances where there's no summons, go to a court and say, please make it an order. You can only do that once the legal process has started. But it doesn't change the stature of that agreement. It is, it is a complete and absolute novation. It takes away the original cause of action. Unless, of course, it's induced by fraud or dishonesty or whatever the case may be, then you can set it aside on that basis. So it's, it's really very powerful. 
I mean, this is not about mediation, but about uh, the current um, system in place in um, litigation where you have two sets of expert witnesses. I think it becomes very difficult for an expert witness to be unbiased and trying to navigate sort of to a, towards a solution because both of these experts are employed in this system yeah. to shed light on a particular component or an aspect of, of, of the case. And it's not easy to say that we must just tell the truth if you're an expert witness because you are there to sort of shine the light on a particular set of facts because that's exactly what you've said. The system is such that it sort of dichotomizes the, the problem into a good and a bad system. Um, so an expert witness can't be unbiased in a way. No, no, I think, I think that's also a very good comment, and, and it's, it's understandable. It's understandable that experts who are employed by Party A, who consult with Party A's advocates, who are become part, they almost become part of the team. I have never in my career had an expert who midway drops me and says, Alan, I've changed my mind, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. They hang in there because they, they almost become responsible for the litigation being driven in a particular direction. You only litigate because the expert supports your client's case. And so they become part of the team and they, they actually get caught into the conflict. They become part of the conflict. And it's like Roger says, eventually they end up with totally different views. I mean, I had a matter that ran for 12 years and it's about uh, somebody's ability to recover from a, a very adverse incident. One expert said he'd recover after six months. The other one said he'd never recover. I mean, you couldn't get further differences than that. And this litigation has been carrying on for 12 years because of that disagreement. What we say in mediation, and sometimes it's going to be necessary to call for an expert opinion. If, if for example, the issue of did somebody do something wrong is critical to the outcome. Parties don't want to move from their positions until they know was there negligence or wasn't there negligence. Was this, was this uh, operation in accordance with the standard or wasn't it? Then if we can refer to one expert or one set of experts. Now, Paul is going to tell you about what SASOG have in mind. They actually have three experts in mind. But if we could have that referred together so both parties take the decision who the expert should be, then there's no reason for them to become part of any team. They are now there to advise both parties. They have a responsibility to both parties to make sure that what they say is fair to both. But more than that, and this, uh, uh, um, Lut, is, is, is something that I'd like to talk about because I feel quite strongly about it. I've said to Sasso, the people that give the advice must understand one thing, and that is they take responsibility for that advice. So if they give advice that is in itself negligent or wrong, they can be held liable for that advice, and they should be insured against that possibility. They must. Otherwise, otherwise, the mediators are not going to refer to those experts because that's the problem that we've had. we've had. We have experts who give advice. They're not liable for the advice that they give. They say, well, we are basing our advice on the instructions, and it's just an opinion, etc., etc., etc. And that is why these cases take as long as they do to be resolved. So part of the solution is to find a new way of getting experts to guide people to a fair outcome, to a fair solution. And I think mediation does that, especially where the, we are dealing with joint appointments, not an appointment by one side or the other. Okay. Anything else? Well, if there are any burning questions, maybe we can continue for another couple of minutes. Um, anyone else? Thank you very much. I was just wondering, you said that one doesn't need to have a legal background to go into mediation. So what kind of training is available for that? Okay. Uh, the tra there, there are a number of organizations. I think we are the one in the Cape. There's another one in the Transvaal. And both have got more or less the same uh, training system. It's an international standard. You have to train for 40 hours. You have to do 10 mediations in the course of those 40 hours. And it's a five-day course. So imagine five years of law compared to five days to bring about solutions at the end of the day that are much better than... And it's a funny thing. You know, when I was a student at university, I often wondered how... Where were the, where were the lawyers? Where were the books? Where are the judges? Where are the courtrooms in Africa? How is all of this done between 1652 in, in this country and elsewhere? And you know what? It was done consensually. The African way of resolving conflict is very, very similar to mediation. 
You sit down, you try to find a solution, you bring the elders in to help you, to facilitate the process. And if they can't decide, well, then the chief's going to say so many cattle or so many this or cut his arms off or whatever. That's, that's a much better system than the one that we've been using. We start adversarially first and we exclude the consensual attempt at, at finding a solution. And so we've got to go back to the, to the traditional way of resolving conflict. It actually is better, as we've seen. And I think the other thing to remember is that our legal system comes from Roman times. Now, let's talk about an operation that results in a brain-damaged child in Roman times. How many pieces of paper would there have been? How long would it have taken before that issue is brought up before the, what they call the praetor in those days, the judge? Within days. Everybody's memory is fresh. There are no documents. People talk about what happened. It's a quick solution. In those days, the adversarial system worked. In fact, the advocates didn't charge anything. You probably know that. They had little, we've still got them, little pockets on the back of our gowns where if somebody thinks you've done a good job, he gives you a couple of gold coins. Well, today we don't, <laughs> we don't rely on that anymore. So the systems, things were very different then. And in, in a different environment, that adversarial system worked. But today, uh, even a simple medico legal matter, you know, you're looking at 10, 15 files. You're looking at having to go through those documents, the hospital records, the nurses' notes over and over again to pick up the slightest little mistake that could change the entire outcome of a whole case. So it's a very different system now that we're applying in a, in a, in a different world with emails and SMSs and hospital records and notes and, 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 and medical, you know, medical theory, if you like, compare it now to what it was like then. Court cases, we've got thousands of court cases we've got to look at you know, to see are they applicable, are they not applicable, and as we do all of that, the bill is just running up and up and up, so that's why it doesn't work anymore.